Oh. I only lost host privileges and it dropped me out of audio. Okay. Now we should be good. Oh, we can get the host. For the speakers, we have a laser pointer. Yeah. It's a good deal. We also have the old-fashioned stick. We want to point with the... I was recording right now. It says it's recording right now. Recording in progress is in progress. I can hear us now. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started. So I'll ask. You're good. Can I hear somebody? So that was that was you on the screen. Oh. Okay. So we'll start with Kevin and, and Dr. Marshall will introduce Kevin. Hi. So welcome everyone. Our first speaker this evening is Kevin Ferrazzini. Uh, originally, originally I think you're from Cleveland, uh, late of Ohio State. Uh, he's going to talk about helpful avian birds. Hello, everybody. As you heard, my name is Kevin Perizzini. Uh I'm Dr. Marshall's RU, and we were working with the survivorship of red-winged blackbirds and American robins, specifically looking at human-dominated areas versus those wildlife preserves. Uh, there's my first extraction, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, so first off, why are preserves important? Well, we know they're important in a few different ways. One is for migratory birds, so birds that are coming from uh, the neotropic region, Central America. We have billions of flying through the Mississippi Flyway, uh, and the Atlantic Flyway, which are almost bird highways. They hit Lake Erie, as you can see on that map, and they don't really want to cross it all at once. So they use the islands as stepping stones and stop over habitat. Um, we also have uh, different, um, different plant species that our um, preserves are really important for, like this uh, northern bog violet. Uh, wasn't endangered in Ohio and is on Kelly's Island as a preserve. Um, and then, obviously, we have our Lake Erie water snake um, that preserves or just one of the factors, uh, not uh, not the sole reason for them rebounding, but it, preserves are really important. Um, so we know preserves are important, but the problem with birds is a lot of people just look at the fall and the spring, and they really don't look at that summer data. So that's what Dr. Marshall and I have been working on. So we're going to look at uh, how birds are surviving during the summer. So how are we going to do that? Well, we've been gathering uh, survivorship data, especially on the adults. For young birds, they have a different survivorship rate. They're young, a little more inexperienced, so you kind of omit them from the data. So we're just looking at the adults that we're catching. Uh, now we're going to compare this to the average songbird survivability, which is around 50%. And that's just a number that a lot of ornithologists agree on and seen throughout the data. Uh, and we're going to compare the preserves and the human dominated systems, as well as a few other things. So I am just a link in the line of banding. This is Dr. Marshall in 2013, and then here's what I took in 2019. Um, so I'm just one link, but the great thing is I am down that, that linkage. I'm already in 2019. And so I have enough data that I can start looking and analyzing, uh, especially with the data that I collected right now. Uh, so we ban on a few different places. We ban on all the islands up here, uh, not Kelly's. Uh, but we do ban on Middle Bass, Middle Bass uh, East Point Preserve. We've been on South Bass, a preserve right past Perry's Monument. And then our three human dominated systems are um, North Bass Island, the Vineyards, we have Gibraltar, and then we have Bayview right across. But we run into another problem uh, birds fly. Uh, and so, how are we going to catch them? So, uh, let's imagine you're a bird at Gibraltar. You see this tree and you want to fly toward it. All right? Let's get closer to that tree. I still see a tree. Nothing. I'm flying, and that's where you hit it. Uh, so by driving in a rebar, setting up poles, and setting up 12-meter nets across, uh, we set up these things called mist nets. Uh, we usually typically set up, uh, I think every single day we set up around 10, and we'll set them up in a variety of different places. Uh, this is Middle Bass Preserve. We set it up in a loop around the preserve, and we'll go out and catch those birds. Uh, so what do we do when we catch and extract them? Uh, well, we take measurements, and we ban them. Uh, under Tom Bartlett's banding permit, we do a few different measurements, like weight, uh, wing length, fat. But what I'm really interested in is what birds we're catching and what birds we've caught in the past, um, so previously banded birds. Uh, some days are busier. 
Some days are not as busy, uh, but we always band our birds. Uh, and it's all done under Stolab's IACA protocol and the North American banding practice. So we get all our data. Well, what do we do with it? Uh, well, we want to use that data uh, and put it into MARC. Uh, MARC is a data analysis software that will give us our survivorship estimates, the ones we're really after. Uh, and we're going to use MARC to compare the survivorship by site, by ecosystem type, human versus preserve, for American robins and red-winged blackbirds. We do it for those two species because we have so much data for them uh, that we can start to get uh, good results. But there's a problem. Not every bird that is alive will be caught. Not every banded bird will get recaught. Uh, so Mark factors in recapture rates. Uh, and it builds multiple models using a variety of different variables. Uh, so it will take different variables, such as uh, island versus island, uh, time versus site, uh, or even uh, like recapture rate versus time. So it keeps taking these different variables, putting them in different ways um, to build multiple models to give us uh, the AI suite, which is our statistic. Uh, the models are given in the statistic, but the lowest one, almost like golf, being the best. The lowest model is going to be the most likely, the one that we can use uh, either next year or at least with the data we have right now, that's the most likely option. Um, anything within two of that is also the most likely. You have to watch out. Sometimes you have to analyze more than others. Uh, now, if they're all the same, we do something called model averaging. So instead of just taking the top one or the top two, if they're all about the same, but then two, we look at the weight. The ones that are weighted more are going to have more weight in our model, uh, but it's still going to use all the models. So now let's look at some results. Obviously, I had to put in some words for you guys. Uh, these are one of my favorites that we've been catching. Great crested flycatcher, northern flicker, and Carolina red. Uh, three beautiful birds out in our preserve and our uh, ecosystem. So in overview, we had 327 new birds that we caught this year with 56 recaptures which is a pretty good estimate, um, 3,048 in total for all of the years combined. And we caught 25 species uh, this year, 15 species in previous years that we didn't catch this year, uh, but 25 is still a pretty good number. Now when we start getting into the real data, let's start with American robins by our site, so the five sites we looked at. When we look at the AIC, we're seeing there's two models that are about the same likelihood. One that looks at survivorship. Um, what the variable is survivorship on the site, and our constant is the recapture rate. So our recapture rate is the same. We've been catching about the same birds. Um, now, for our second model, it's the exact opposite. It's saying survivorship was the exact same over all the different sites, but your recapture rate was different. If that makes sense, I'll explain it a little more right here. For our American Robin recapture rates for the site, um, something like Bayview, it was about 10%. So we caught 10% of the birds that we've previously banded. Um, middle bass and north bass are low. They're a gap in our data because we didn't catch that many birds there. That's about it. Um, maybe north bass will admit uh, later on just because we don't catch any robins there. Um, but for the most part, you'll see that the main part is uh, the higher the recapture rate, the more birds that we're recapturing, the more data we're getting, the higher uh, our survivorship is. Um, and it's showing that it's around 50%. So that data that we were looking at before, we're looking at around 50%. So that's about average. Um, now going to red winged blackbird by site, we're looking at something a little different. If our survivorship is constant, but our recapture rate uh, is different based on all the years that we've done. Um, so if we look at red winged blackbird recapture rate, uh, they're all variable across all the years, which makes sense because sometimes you don't get lucky. Sometimes you catch birds. Uh, you have a good year recapture a lot of birds. Sometimes you don't. The nice thing is you might be able to see a trend uh, throughout the years that we are recapturing more. Um, but the main point of this graph is Mark gave us a 0.51, so 50, around 50% 50 survivability, which is the number we are looking at. Um, now let's start getting into the habitat, so ecosystem versus preserve. Uh, when we have, uh, sorry, human dominated versus preserve. Uh, American Robin by habitat, we have to deploy our model averaging. They're all about the same AIC. So we're going off the weight. That means it's going to give us survivability by human dominated and preserved, and recapture rate by human dominated and preserved. Uh, so our recapture rate, a lot of error. Uh, that makes sense because we're looking at so many models uh, that there's going to be a lot of variation, and there's going to be a lot of standard error. The nice thing is our American Robin survivorship for human dominated and preserved came out pretty good. Uh, we're seeing pretty close to that 50%. 
maybe a little bit on human dominated, but again, with that air, it's going to be around the same, uh, around the same, around 15%. Now, when we look at red-winged blackbirds for habitat, uh, we have to take into account two models for this one with a fair amount of variables. The first one saying if survivability is the same over both human dominated and preserved, well, let's look at the recapture rate. Is it different uh, between time and between habitat? The next one's going to say, no, I think the survivability is different between the two, and the recapture rate is different between the two, and the time's different. So you're going to see there's a fair amount of variables here. Uh, for the first one, you see, going through all the time, we have variation, uh, especially in human and preserved, throughout the time, which makes sense, again, as I said, it is, it's typical to have some variation, especially in recaptures, uh, between the times. But the main point is, we got around 50% for the survivability. And that's saying that there really isn't a difference between human and preserved for 50%. Now, this one breaks it up. It's saying that human dominated is a little less at 0.49 to 49%, uh, while the preserved are up at 53% survivability. So it's saying maybe the preserves are a little bit more, or maybe they're better for the birds. But again, there's a little bit too much air to kind of uh, take any inferences from that. Uh, so again, what do we see? Human and preserve, they have some air, but it's in the range to expect. Um, they don't differentiate too, too much, but it means that everything's providing habitat for the rubbing blackbird and the American robin that we're seeing. Um, so why is this? Well, American robins are generalists. Uh, as you can see on the range map, they're pretty much everywhere, and I'm sure all of you have seen them in your houses. Well, not in your houses. <laughs> That'd be bad. Uh, but you've seen them in the forest. You've seen them around your houses. Um, so they're pretty much generalists. Maybe if we looked at a sensitive species, uh, something that is a little more sensitive to humans coming in, uh, we'd see greater differences. But uh, we don't have the data at this time to analyze that. For red-winged blackbirds, island habitats are atypical. On the mainland, you normally see red-winged blackbirds breeding in just marshes. And so when you come to the islands, things that I would typically see uh, that I think would be breeding in some kind of habitat, like middle bats, uh, it's out competing. The red-winged blackbirds are out competing them or they're just not here. I'm sure it's a variety of variables that I would like to look at in the future, but for now, again, we just don't have the data. But there's just a lot of red-winged blackbirds. Uh, and that might be leading to that 50-50 that we're seeing. Um, I'm going to leave this slide. Uh, if you want to ask me about it later, let me know if you want to talk about diversity and where we saw one. Uh, so in conclusion, if you had to justify preserves on, uh, on the breeding birds, there's not too much to justify. Uh, the preserves are good. Uh, but this data isn't enough. However, this is just filling the gap. This data, combined with the others that I showed before, uh, preserves are important. Although they're not necessarily doing better than the human dominated for breeding birds and their survivorship, they're definitely not doing worse. And it can be aiding to show, with all the other things, why preserves are important. And there's nothing negative about them. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Stone Lab all of our boat captains for taking us out and shuttling us back and forth from all the islands, uh, staff for making the awesome lunches and getting us access to vehicles, uh, Tom Bartlett, who's the master bander, uh, Lisa Brohl, who's helped us before, uh, the Black Swamp Conservancy uh, for letting us ban on the uh, parks that we've gone to, and then obviously my evolution class for coming out with us every Saturday and helping us ban. Um, and obviously Dr. Marshall for teaching me how to set up, extract, and ban birds, uh, making the summer extraordinary, uh, phenomenal, and I've learned a lot from him. Questions? We have time for a couple questions. Yeah. Can you briefly talk about the slide that you picked? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk about it really briefly. If you want to bring me back. Bring me back. Can I? I'm pressing back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll tell oh. <laughs> That'll make my job more difficult. This is not going to work. This is going to be fast. Do you want to? <laughs> Do we have any other questions that I can answer? Yeah. Um, you guys come up with a reason that you didn't catch any robins on North Pass? Um, I know there's been a few data points in the past. I I saw a few flying around, but they just weren't where we were banding. Uh, we're kind of banding. I'd have to look into it more, but it just didn't really seem like they were out there. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, basically, this slide, I was looking more into the diversity of birds. 
So how many species we saw in preserved versus um, our human dominated wolf zone seeing, although the survivorship is the same, maybe uh, we've caught more diversity of birds in the preserve. Uh, just trying to see if there's anything different. Didn't really find anything. Um, just capturing a bird doesn't mean it's breeding. So even though we captured one more species in preserve uh, overall since 2011, um, it doesn't mean it's breeding. So you can't really look at those unique species. Some of them it just appeared once. Uh, so uh, and then, but at least the unique species gave me a little more insight at how the habitat differed. So some of the uh, species in the preserve, like uh, eastern wood peewee, you're typically just going to find that in woods, uh, and so you're not going to find that human dominated. But something like human, I was seeing a lot more house sparrows, a lot more starlings, of some kind of invasive. Uh, we were catching a lot more of them in humans. So it would be interesting to look through uh, a little more in depth into the uh, species that we caught and see if there's any more difference there. Yeah. So when you say in the birds, do you have information on the band that would tell you things like this bird has been recaptured multiple times or this bird has moved around and is not in the same place anymore? Yeah. Capture a bird doesn't have a band on it. I'll put a band on it that just has a unique number that I've been I've been given. So I get the bands from North American Banding Council. They send me the bands. They have the master data sheet. And they'll give us a band and it'll have a unique number. Um, let's say in two years I catch that bird again. I can write down the number and send it into the data, and they can send back, Hey, you you uh, you inputted this data two years ago. You said this bird. Uh, caught two years ago, um, and you caught it on middle bass, and in two years, now I caught it on north bass. Uh, we use a little more, we kind of bypass that, we keep it all in an Excel document, and we have since 2011, all the bands that we've ever wrote down and captured, so I can go back into there and quickly look up, uh, we caught a red-winged blackbird, uh, how old was it? And I can see, hey, this red-winged blackbird was caught in the same place, but in 2013. Uh, recreational fishing supports a $2 billion per year industry. Um, so science can help support that industry as Lake Erie undergoes changes in water color and clarity. Um, and one of the main uh, knowledge gaps that we have um, is the effect of algal turbidity on uh, visual capabilities of sport fish in Lake Erie. Um, so turbidity is the uh, amount of suspended uh, particles in the water. So that can be sediment particles or algal cells. Um, and so we've seen an increased uh, prevalence of uh, algal turbidity in Lake Erie uh, with the reoccurrence of harmful algal blooms each summer. Uh, but we also have a high prevalence of sedimentary turbidity in Lake Erie, especially in the spring um, from the uh, outflows from rivers feeding into the lake and during major storm events which can uh, resuspend sediments from the bottom of the lake. Um, so turbidity can impact the visual capabilities of sport fish in a variety of ways. Um, one of which is by reducing the distance from which they can see their prey. Um, but in some cases, it can have a positive effect on prey detection in fish. Uh, so for example, these zooplankton have translucent bodies, so a slight amount of turbidity uh, helps increase the contrast between them and the water behind them, making it easier for fish, uh, for example, larval fish that feed on zooplankton, uh, to see them in the water column. Um, so smallmouth bass are an important uh, recreationally targeted fish in Lake Erie uh, as well as around North America. And if you ask uh, any fisher, they tell you that uh, the effectiveness of their different lures varies in different water conditions. 
Um, there's really not a scientific basis for them to uh, build these theories on, but that's one of the goals of this study is to provide that scientific basis. Um, another implication for this study uh, is in uh, foraging effectiveness for these fish because in fishing, uh, you're trying to simulate uh, like a prey item for the fish to go after. Uh, so our results from this study might have some implications um, for uh, uh, these fish finding prey in the lake. Um, so uh, one interesting thing that uh, researchers in the Gray Lab have found is that walleye's uh, vision is impaired more uh, drastically by algal turbidity than by sedimentary turbidity. Um, and they've also found that uh, certain lure colors perform better in certain turbidity conditions for uh, walleye fishing. So for example, if you have a black lure, uh, you'll be able to create more contrast between that lure and the water behind it than if, say, you're using a uh, yellow lure in algal turbidity. Um, so uh, we in initially intended to use walleye in this experiment. Um, we were using the raceways over in the Aquatic Visitor Center for our trials. And they're fairly shallow. Uh, they're painted white and lit with fluorescent lights. So the walleye weren't quite uh, comfortable in those raceways. Uh, so we decided to use uh, smallmouth bass, um, which have similar visual uh, capabilities to uh, walleye. Um, both these fish have dichromatic vision, so they're able to see red and green wavelengths uh, most uh, sharply. And just for reference, humans have trichromatic vision. We're able to see uh, we have an extra set of cones color detecting cells uh, that allow us to see uh, blue wavelengths more easily. Um, but uh, so we decided to use uh, gold and pink lures in this uh, study because those are the most popular lure colors used by Lake Erie charter captains fishing for walleye. Um, so if we presented, say, a red and a yellow lure to uh, one of these fish, uh, we would expect the smallmouth to choose uh, or to have a preference for the red lure because they're able to see those wavelengths. Uh, better than the yellow wavelength. Um, and you can see that uh, the wavelengths that smallmouth bass uh, can detect are shifted slightly toward uh, the red side of the spectrum from walleye. So there may be some differences there. Um, but as I said, smallmouth are also commonly targeted uh, around North America. So it's interesting to see uh, their color preferences as well. Um, so like I said, uh, we used pink and gold lures in this study. Um, I expected uh, to see a preference for pink lures and smallmouth bass um, because they should be able to detect those wavelengths um, better than those uh, yellow wavelengths. Um, and especially because uh, pink offers a high contrast with all of the different uh, turbidity conditions we were going to use in this study, uh, helping the fish to see the lures uh, more easily. Um, so we tested this hypothesis uh, using the, one of the raceways over in the Aquatic Visitor Center divided the raceway into sections and put a fish into each section. Uh, we had a removable divider um, to obscure the fish's uh, view of the gold and pink floors, which we hung on the opposite side of the raceway. Um, and then uh, we hung those lures in front of submersible pumps that would cause the lures to move uh, in the current so that the fish were attracted to them. Uh, so then at the start of each trial, we removed that barrier. Uh, the fish was able to swim toward the lures and then indicate its preference uh, by going to one lure or the other. Uh, so uh, some of the ways that we determined lure preference in these smallmouth bass trials um, were by recording the first lure that they approached at the start of each trial. Um, so this is applicable to fishing scenarios because if you're using a lure, uh, you want the fish to be able to see it from a good distance away and to catch its attention uh, right off the bat. Um, but then we also tried to gauge their interest in each lure uh, by uh, recording the amount of time they spent near each lure. Uh, so if you have a section of the raceway, uh, we divided this section into four quadrants uh, so that we could time uh, the amount of time the fish spent in those quadrants containing the lures. Um, so here's a short video. All right, here's a short video showing the beginning of a typical trial. You see the fish enter from the right side of the frame. And as it approaches the pink lure, it's oriented toward that lure. And it changes its orientation toward the other lure. And you'll see it kind of stop by the gold lure. And so that might uh, kind of indicate the preference for that lure over the pink lure. Now keep in mind, our trials lasted for 30 minutes. Uh, so that gave the fish 
of time to move between the lures uh, to give us a better idea of which one uh, it might have preferred. Um, so we use three different treatments. Um, you can see the clear treatment on the left, the sediment treatment in the middle, and the algal treatment on the right. Um, we tried to use each of these treatments in 12 trials, um, using each fish no more than once per treatment, and randomizing the order of uh, treatments in which we used each fish. Um, and then uh, overall, we ended up running 31 trials total, uh, 15 in the clear treatment, 11 in the sediment treatment, and 5 in the algal treatment. Um, and then we were only able to consider uh, those trials in which fish moved between quadrants of the raceway um, uh, because if the fish weren't moving at all, we couldn't say that they were responding to the lures. Um, so we wouldn't be able to say that they were uh, preferring one lure over the other. And then for our analyses, um, we had to use even a smaller subset of the trials we ran uh, because um, we could only use the trials where the fish approached the lures uh, because that's the only way that they could indicate their preference for one lure over the other. Um, so here you can see the number of trials that the fish approached uh, the pink lure first versus the number of trials they approached the gold lure first in each treatment. Um, so overall, they approached the pink lure first um, in every treatment. I performed a chi-square test to determine uh, whether they uh, approached the pink lure um, more, more often than the gold lure, but I found that this difference was not significant, um, and that's probably due to the small number of trials in which we actually had the fish approach the lures. Uh, so here on the y-axis, you can see the proportion of time that the fish spent in the uh, quadrant with the pink lure over the uh, amount of time they spent in one, uh, one of those two quadrants with the lures. Um, so above that 0.5 line, uh, the fish were spending more time next to the pink lure. And below that line, they were spending more time next to the gold lure. Um, I used a mixed linear model to determine that there was a significant difference in the proportion of time they spent near each lure between those treatments. Um, but as you can see, we only uh, ran one successful trial in the algal treatment. Uh, so that kind of provides an outlier uh, that we can't really draw uh, reliable conclusions from. Um, so then I used a post hoc test to determine that there was not a significant difference in the proportion of time that the fish spent near the pink lure and the clear versus sediment treatment, um, which show, uh, tells us that the fish did not have a change in preference uh, for one lure over the other between the clear and sediment treatment, as we expected. Uh, so if I can draw your attention back to this slide, uh, something interesting we found in the algal treatments is that uh, while we only ran five trials, they did move between the treatments in all five of those trials, but in only one of those trials did they move toward the lures. Um, so that was an abnormally low proportion of trials uh, for them to move toward the lures, and that might be because um, although the algal treatment was the same turbidity as the sediment treatment, um, they might not have been able to see the lures as easily on the other side of the raceway. Um, another reason that may be the case, um, they might not be interested in eating at all um, in algal treatment. Um, so as I said, we found that the smallmouth bass prefer the pink lures in the clear and sediment treatment, um, which is probably because they can detect the color of the pink lure more easily than they can see the gold lure, so that would provide more color contrast between the lure and the background color of the water. Um, and we would expect to see this uh, same effect in the algal trial, uh, where they would prefer the pink lure, um, if we were able to run more successful trials in the algal uh, treatment. So if I were to uh, do this experiment again, I might try a different setup. Uh, for example, having multiple fish in the raceway during one trial, and then kind of pulling the lure through the raceway during a trial to see how the fish react. Um, in a situation that might uh, replicate fishing more closely. Um, and then I could do that with different lure colors and the different treatments uh, again. Um, I would also like to try this experiment with some different lure types. We used spoons in uh, this experiment, and spoons aren't the most popular lure type for smallmouth bass fishing. But it would be interesting to see how um, the smallmouth bass respond to uh, different lure colors when we use different types of lures as well. And finally, since we performed this experiment in a controlled laboratory setting, it would be interesting to do the same thing uh, kind of in a field setting. Um, and the Gray Lab is currently uh, performing a controlled angling experiment to see whether uh, lure preference in walleye is impacted by turbidity conditions. 
Um, so while we didn't get great results for the algal treatment, the information we did collect will be important to uh, those recreational fishers um, in and around Lake Erie, um, especially as the lake continues to change. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank the Gray Lab, uh, Dr. Suzanne Gray and Dr. Chelsea Neiman for the help with this project. Uh, Stone Lab for providing me with the opportunity to partic participate in the REU uh, experience. And finally, uh, the Ohio Sea Grant College Program. So with that, I'll take any questions you guys have. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Uh, no, pink is like a pretty unnatural color to find in an aquatic environment. Um, so, I mean, fish might strike a lure for two reasons. Uh, primarily, uh, they see it as prey or they are, uh, have an aggressive display towards uh, whatever they're striking. Um, so, um, that still doesn't really answer your question because there's not something that they would have to defend their nest against in an aquatic environment that would be pink. Um, suppose it's just um, whatever they can see the best probably draws their attention the best and then, uh, and then their interest is held so that, that we see the results that we saw. So. Uh -huh. uh, so in the replay, uh, how do you know the fish was targeting or going towards the lure rather than kind of moving into the group? Uh -huh. um, so, well, on the slide where I showed the proportion of uh, time they spent next to each lure, um, we did see that there was a difference in the amount of time they spent next to the pink lure versus the gold lure. Uh, so if they were just kind of going into the current, we would expect those uh, proportions to be very similar. Um, but we also uh, did some trials without the lures to see if they would still swim uh, in the same way. But yeah. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good way to answer that um, other than I didn't really notice that the water was being stained by the, uh, the treatment that we were using. Um, I blended it pretty fine, um, so there may have been some stain, but um, yeah, I don't really have a great way to answer your question. Did you use spirulina? We used spirulina, yeah. Okay, the next speaker will be Audrey Labelly, and um, she is from the University of Cincinnati. Um, when you're going to spend five weeks driving around eight hours once a, a, a week in a car with someone, you've got to figure out what are some common points you can talk about. Um, my nephew goes to the University of Cincinnati, so at the state I've ever met, and he 
she's an engineering major, she's a biology major, and she said, well, they kind of keep to themselves. And that's uh, the way I've always found the engineers on campus, so she does not know him. So the second thing I went to was, well, um, where have you been before and things like that. Turns out she has been to Brazil and worked in the Amazon River Basin. I've been to Brazil and worked in the La Plata River Basin, so that was good. The third thing, and this was the best because it dealt with driving around, one of the things you can do is listen to music. And I had three big boxes of CDs in my car throughout the term. I'd bring them in, and we'd each pick one back and forth. And I, unless someone in here told her, she often picked Jethro Tull and Rush. So I, I, I was like, then we had a lot to talk about. So um, I'd like to thank the Ohio Department of Higher Education because this is the second year of this project, and you'll see some inner year comparisons. And Audrey, you're up. Thank you, Dr. King. And so, as she said, I'm looking at the changes in algal communities of the Maumee River, as well as environmental factors that may be affecting those changes. So I know you guys are all very familiar with the harmful algal blooms that have been a, a reoccurrence in Lake Erie. But just as a reminder, we're concerned about harmful algal blooms because they expose humans to toxins. And we are especially I'm interested in recreational exposure because we know that water treatment plants can detect and remove toxins, but people who are on the rivers and lakes experiencing blooms interact with water that may have toxins at very low concentrations, but over a long period of time, we're not really sure what those uh, interactions at low concentrations will be, what the effects will be on human health. And uh, there's currently not a, a clear understanding of what causes uh, harmful algal blooms to produce toxins because sometimes blooms are toxic and sometimes they're not. And uh, we know that different forms of nutrient availability may affect um, whether toxins are being produced, such as nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, river conditions may also affect toxin production, especially temperature and discharge. And so the Maumee River is known to be the primary source of nutrient loading into Lake Erie's western basin. But in 2016, we saw that the river can also host its own harmful algal blooms. And um, in a, following a period of low rainfall and low river uh, flow, and also high nutrient loading and warmer temperatures, the Maumee River experienced a bloom of planktothrix, and there was also low levels of microcystins detected in the water. And so um, the Maumee River is also known to have other cyanotoxin producers, such as microcystis and dolcoquermum. And so anyone who's interacting with the water, as is this family at one of our sampling sites, is also interacting with any toxins that might be in the water. So there are a couple of different uh, groups of phytoplankton that I'll be talking about. There's blue-green algae, which is cyanobacteria. There's green algae, diatoms, and cryptophytes. And typically, cyanobacteria appear later in the summer and early fall, which is when we see the harmful algal blooms. But in recent years, cyanobacteria has been appearing earlier and earlier, even as early as March. And so my objective was to track any temporal and spatial trends in phytoplankton communities in the Maumee, as well as any environmental factors that may be affecting those changes. And my hypothesis was that we would see a late cyanobacterial bloom this year due to the high rainfall that occurred in the spring. So a lot of farmers were unable to plant their fields as early as they would have liked, and uh, some farmers didn't even get to plant at all. So I speculated that there would be uh, less nutrients getting into the river earlier in the summer. And then I also speculated that there would be a greater mass of phytoplankton at the downstream sites due to an accumulation of nutrients. So to achieve this objective, I sampled six different sites along the Maumee ranging from 159 kilometers down to 37 kilometers from the mouth of the river. And each site was at, uh, located at a park with significant recreational access to the river. So these first two um, are sampled directly from the riverbank, and then the others had uh, docks. 
and we often saw people kayaking or boating or fishing. So these, again, are areas where people are interacting with any toxins that are present in the water. So at each site, I would um, collect samples of water to be tested back in the lab. And then I also use a sonde to measure temperature and dissolved oxygen of the surface water. And then a secchi tube to estimate turbidity. And then back in the lab, um, we use a fluor probe to um, estimate the concentrations of the different algal groups. So we would load a sample of water into this slot, and then the fluor probe is able to detect the different fluorescence that is given off by the different algal groups, and it can then determine the concentrations of the different groups. And then Dr. Chaffin's lab uh, took control of analyzing the different nutrients. And so we looked at total phosphorus, which is uh, all forms of phosphorus in the water. We looked at total keldol nitrogen, which is ammonium and organic nitrogen. Dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which is ammonium and nitrate, and those are the forms that the algae actually takes in to grow. And then dissolved reactive phosphorus, which is different forms of phosphate, which is again the form that the algae actually takes from the water. And then um, at the end, we did statistical analysis using ANOVA two-way, looking at differences between sites and across the different dates. And then using the data that Dr. King's RU from last year collected, we also used a Mann-Whitney and paired t test to compare differences between the two years. So these are the weekly results of the, um, the changes in the communities. So um, as you can see, they start off fairly low. And then um, on July 2nd, there's an, a dramatic increase in growth. And then on the very last week, there's an even bigger change. And then this is just the same information, but um, shows the proportions of the different groups. And the um, green algae and diatoms are fairly similar at first, and cyanobacteria is um, low, but, um, and then over time, it de cyanobacteria decreases, and diatoms dominate. So here are the concentrations of the different phytoplankton groups by date, and note the different scales. So diatom concentrations are much higher than, for example, the cyanobacteria, which never go above three. And so the only group that saw a seasonal progression were the diatoms, well, it's the greatest increase at the last date. But the other groups aren't quite as clear. The cryptophytes and the green algae are pretty similar, again, experiencing growth after July 2nd. And then the cyanobacteria um, doesn't change too much besides that second week of growth. And then looking at the change in nutrients by date, um, there's, again, not a very clear seasonal progression. The only one that shows some sort of progression is TKN, which <coughs> increases up um, to July 2nd and then drops a little bit. But something that's interesting to note in these results is the, in the dissolved inorganic nitrogen and the dissolved reactive phosphorus, both experience their highest um, concentrations on June 25th and then their lowest on July 2nd, which is, again, the date that we saw the growth in algae. And so this means that there was a lot of dissolved nutrients in the water that the algae was then able to assimilate. And then the, after all the algae used it up, the dissolved nutrient concentrations were much lower. And then looking at the results at a whole, um, there appears to be a trend of increasing biomass going down uh, the downstream sites, but this difference was not significant. Um, there is, however, a significant difference in between the dates. And again, this is caused by the, just the dramatic growth that uh, happened after July 2nd. And then in comparing 2018 and 2019, there is a significant difference in the total, uh, total algae found at each site. And that's probably caused by the high concentration of algae at Mary Jane Thurston. Which in 2018, which Dr. King's student noted uh, could have been due to a localized sewage issue. Um, there's not a uh, significant difference um, in the weeks of the studies, 
of um, changes in total concentration, but there does seem to be a bit of a delay in 2019 compared to 2018, as 2018 concentration of algae was much higher in the first two weeks. And then looking at the composition between the two years, 2018 saw, um, again, note the scale, the 2018 had higher averages, and then um, there was higher cyanobacteria in 2018 and lower in 2019, and 2019 saw, again, a dominance of diatoms. Um, in looking at the nutrients, there's a couple of different ways to compare the two years. One is just to look at the dissolved reactive phosphorus, and if you look at that, 2019 has much higher DRP concentrations which would lead you to think that there would be more algae. But um, a different metric is total bioavailable phosphorus. And this was a concept introduced by Dr. Johnson, who um, looks at the MAMI nutrient loading for the NOAA PABS forecast. And she uh, proposed this equation, which is um, dissolved reactive phosphorus plus um, a certain con uh, proportion of total particulate phosphorus which is derived from total phosphorus minus dissolved reactive phosphorus. And that gives you the total bioavailable phosphorus. So comparing, there's only data for the first three weeks of 2019 because it takes so long to analyze the nutrients, so we don't have the data yet from the last two weeks. But if you look at the first three weeks, there's not too much of a difference at first and then a little bit more of a difference in week three. And then, uh, to look at nitrogen, there's another metric to use as well. Um, reduced forms of nitrogen versus oxidized forms and reduced forms have, um, they're more, uh, phytoplankton prefers to use those forms to grow. And so if you look at that, 2019 has more um, reduced forms of nitrogen, which would imply more algal growth, but again, this is not what we saw. Um, 2019 had much higher diatoms due to primarily the uh, cooler temperatures. In 2018, there were warmer temperatures, and cyanobacteria prefer warmer waters, so they were able to grow more. But in 2019, the temperatures started off lower and never reached quite as high in the later weeks, so diatoms continued to dominate. And then looking at river conditions further explains differences between the two years. So in uh, 2018, the temperatures in early June were around 22 degrees Celsius, while in 2019, they were much lower in early June, around 19 degrees Celsius. And so again, this means that um, in 2019, cyanobacteria didn't uh, have that warmer water, and so they did not grow as much. And then that also explains why uh, there was more total algal growth in the earlier weeks of the study in 2018 because the warmer waters were more um, productive for growth. And then you can also look at discharge. In 2018, uh, there were two periods of high discharge, but in the rest of the weeks of the study, there was, um, it was closer to the historical median, while in 2019, discharge was always higher than the historical median. And then if you, uh, this red line indicates that July 2nd date where we saw the increase in total algae. And if you look, it's, um, it follows a period of warming temperatures and lower discharge, which appears to be the conditions that are most conducive for phytoplankton growth. And so this year, Mami, the Mami River's communities were primarily influenced by temperature and discharge. Um, to cooler temperatures in June delayed the total growth. Um, the effects of nutrients on the um, on the algae growth is inconclusive just because we don't have all the data yet, but in um, the next couple of weeks I hope to go back and maybe see some more trends. Um, and then I'm interested in last week uh, that heat wave that we had, that may have uh, increased the cyanobacterial growth. Um, so if temperatures continue to rise, this will, we will see more cyanobacteria. And so um, Dr. Timothy Davis of Bowling Green is going to look at these samples and uh, determine if there are any toxins present and who is responsible for making those toxins. And then we can also look back at the data that I collected and maybe then explain what we see in the toxins. And then uh, just something to keep in mind in the future is as um, climate change continues to affect the seasonal conditions, the, uh, there may be um, more warmer summers, more extreme precipitation events that affect discharge. 
And so um, it is predicted that with warming temperatures, you'll see more cyanobacterial growth, which may lead to more toxins and more harmful algal blooms. So I'd like to thank Dr. Kane, um, Dr. Chaffin, and his research assistants who helped me so much, and then Ohio Sea Grant, Ohio State University, and friends of SOMA. Any other questions? Um, the discharge, yes, they are the same. So I, I don't remember exactly how your day would fall on top of people. Maybe it's kind of fun to watch the discharge on top of your concentration data. Because I think what you would probably see is that it might almost be you can find that almost like a threshold where when discharge is below a certain value, that leads to the growth. Especially when you see in 2018 that flip flop where it was high discharge, low discharge. Um, it just means the like pretty much the flow of the river, like how much the volume um, of times like the area. I think it is. Determining 
how the forest composition on Kelly's Island in a lowland forest site changed due to the disappearance of those ash trees. And in order to do so, we're going to compare um, our data, our importance values of the key tree species present in that forest to past studies done in similar lowland forests on Kelly's Island. Um, one in 2007, one of Dr. Kane's REUs did a similar um, study uh, right when the ash borers started invading, and then also another study done in 1984 before the presence of ash um, borer beetles. And we were also comparing our data to similar studies done on Middle Bass Island. Um, so my study site was a section of Woolland Forest um, on the north side of Kelly's Island in the State Park campground right near the North Pond. Uh, it's been state property since the mid-1960s, and the surrounding area is mostly former vineyards and orchards, but um, my study site area itself has always been pretty swampy. It's right by the North Pond, so it's never been cultivated. Um, so here's just some pictures of my site. Um, this one here on the left, that's just kind of like an outside overview looking into the forest. Um, these two are some pictures of the inside. You can see this one's pretty open. Um, and this one's pretty dense, so there was some variation in what we had to walk through. And there are also a lot of fallen ash trees. Um, all of the ash that were there before us so are now on the ground. Um, and so to do this, we used the same methods um, as that 1984 study so that we could keep our results consistent and make them more comparable. Um, so we had two transects set up. Each one is a 50-meter line, and on alternating sides is a 10-by-10-meter plot. And nested inside each big plot, there is a 5 by 5 meter plot. And then nested inside of that, there is a 2 meter by 0.5 meter plot. And so um, in the 10 by 10 meter plots, we were measuring the diameter at breast height, which is the diameter of the tree right at breast height, which is about 4.5 feet above the ground. We were measuring all the trees with a diameter greater than 2.5 centimeters. In that middle plot, we were measuring all the trees between 1 centimeter and 2.5 centimeters. And then in the small plots, we were measuring all the saplings or anything that had a diameter less than a centimeter. Um, and using those diameter at breast height measurements and the counts of the trees overall, we were able to calculate um, values for the relative density, frequency, and coverage of the trees. And the sum of those gave us an importance value for each species. And using that, we used um, this rating system that um, Warner used in 1984 to um, rate each tree based on their importance percentage, so five being the most important. Um, so here's a couple pictures of the um, key species that we found. We found a lot of green ash saplings, um, some autumn olive, which is an invasive species, and we also found some eastern cottonwood, which are these two big guys in the background, and then a lot of rough leaf dogwood, which you can see the underside of the leaves in that picture are rough leaf dogwood. Um, so the rough leaf dogwood was by far the most abundant tree that we found. Um, it, oh, it made up over 80% of the forest. Um, a large majority of the saplings that we found were green ash. We didn't really find anything else. And we also didn't really see any mature ash trees. There were only two um, individuals that were greater than two and a half centimeters. And they were each about three centimeters in diameter, so they were still pretty small. Um, Again, we did see um, that invasive species, the autumn olive present, and um, a couple eastern cottonwoods and American elm. Um, so we did see some other species present in that forest, but again, for the sake of consistency, we didn't include anything that appeared in less than three plots, and we also didn't measure any vines or brambles because those were also not included in past studies. Um, and there were um, a couple silver maples and eastern red cedars, but those just happened to not fall into our plots, so we couldn't account for them in our data. Um, so after we calculated those importance values, we found that rough leaf dogwood was the most important species um, in that forest at about 50%. And um, it's interesting that um, for the American elm and the green ash, they had very similar importance um, percentages. And that was because although there were like a few um, individuals of American elm, they were very large, and so they had a very large coverage, so that made them more important. And for the green ash, even though they were saplings and they were really small, there were just a large number of them, so their high frequency is what contributed to their high importance value. And so with that importance rating system, um, we were able to see that the rough leaf dogwood importance has increased over time. 
and the green ash importance has decreased over time. And we also saw um, the establishment of an invasive species, the autumn olive. And we also saw the disappearance of a lot of species that were formerly um, present in that area. And so um, there's a couple of reasons why those species might not be present anymore. Um, one of them could be like the silver maple or the red cedar. They just happen to not fall on their, in our plot, but they were present in the forest, but we couldn't account for them. Um, another reason is that the past couple of years has been wetter than usual, and so some of the species that were present before, like the hackberry, they're more typically found in drier areas, so maybe that could be contributing to why they're no longer there. And then another big reason is we don't know the exact location of Borner's study in 1984. We do know that it was a lowland forest on Kelly's Island, but we don't know exactly which one, so it could be that um, when he did that study back in the 80s, like it was a completely different forest, so there might have just been different tree species um, present to begin with. Um, another interesting thing, there was a lot of multiflora rose, which is another invasive species, and that was pretty prevalent throughout the entire forest, making it really hard to walk through. Um, but again, we didn't um, include them in our data, but I did measure them just because I wanted to see what their importance value would be, and it would have been an importance value of one. Um, and as I said before, like all of the um, saplings were green ash, and so we were wondering if maybe um, other species of trees, um, their saplings were getting outcompeted, um, and it's also possible that the invasive species were exhibiting some allelopathic properties, so sending out chemicals into the ground that um, inhibited the growth of those saplings. Um, so overall, the most important species in this forest changed from green ash to roughly dogwood, and it's very likely that the disappearance of those green ash is what allowed invasive species like multiflora rose and autumn olive to become established in the first place, because disturbances like fallen trees and canopy gaps um, increases the plant's ability to become invasive in an area, and for the multiflora rose specifically, those canopy gaps are really important to their growth because they need that light. Um, and when we compared um, our study to the similar studies on middle bass, we found very similar things that they did, the increase in the dogwood, the decrease in the ash, and the establishment of the species. The only difference that instead of was instead of seeing the rose and the autumn olive, they saw species like buckthorn and amer honeysuckle. And so just some um, future research ideas. Um, the rough leaf dogwood is an uh, early successional species, so it's very shade intolerant. So it'll be interesting to see in a couple of years um, what species replaces the dogwood. Um, once those canopy gaps start to close up and the light, available, uh, light availability begins to decrease. Uh, and it, it would also be interesting to look at upland forests because we did look at lowland forests to see if they would have a similar composition change, if they would also be having those um, ash trees, or no, those invasive species invading. And it would also be interesting to look at South Bath as well. They, they have a larger population of blue ash, and those have not, they started to decline in population, but they haven't totally disappeared yet. So in a couple of years, it'll be interesting to see um, what comes up and replaces those. And so I'd like to thank Lisa for being such a wonderful mentor. Um, the Kelly's Island State Park staff, especially Chris Ashley for being so accommodating, Leslie for all the historical info, um, my mom, Mary Southern, she came out and helped me measure trees one day, <laughs> Dr. Kane, Dr. Chaffin, and OSU staff for all their help, and the Friends of Stone Lab. Yeah.
Yeah, um, let me go back to that. So, we're going back. Okay, yeah. So, um, from the uh, diameter of breast height measurements, um, we were able to calculate, like, the basal area that the tree takes up. And from that, we were able to calculate, like, how much coverage it has. And then from the counts, we were able to um, calculate, like, the density, like, how much, how dense the trees are in that area, and also the frequency, so, like, how many. And the importance value is just the sum of all those factors. I'm not 100% exactly how long. I know that since the borers do prefer larger trees, like past a certain point, they will um, they will be more targeted. I'm not 100% sure how big that is, but I do know that the um, the only like large ash trees that we found in that forest were about three centimeters in diameter, so they were still pretty small.
And as we know, the harmful algae blooms have a lot of negative side effects. Um, and oftentimes, people call the blooms, it's just a um, increase in excessive biomass of these algae. So they're unattractive, and they smell bad, and they can make the water taste funny. Um, it's bad for the economy, you know, fishing or swimming or any sort of tourism, water sports is not good. And it's also harmful to the wildlife, so uh, there's less dissolved oxygen towards the bottom of the lake due to these algae blooms. And it also affects fish and other aquatic organisms. And it's also difficult for plants to survive or grow and compete with the algae in more turbid waters. And it can, most importantly, it's uh, extremely toxic to especially pets, a lot of dogs die, and humans. Um, so the larger the blooms, the more potential there are for toxins. So we try to kind of figure out what stimulates the algae. And so there's the three types of algae that we're talking about are, like I said before, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and green algae. But the most interesting is the cyanobacteria because these are the, are the algae that have the ability to produce toxins. And the two common toxins are microcystins, which are hepatotoxins or liver toxins, and then the saxitoxins, which are very potent uh, neurotoxins. And so why study benthic algae? It, benthic algae is a lot less studied than algae in the water column. It, it's a lot more difficult to stimulate the environment and all the different impacts at the bottom of the lake, and it requires more resources and utensils to measure that. And um, what's more interesting is that there's, it's theorized that uh, benthic algae may be a source of production of the saxitoxins. Um, and saxitoxins aren't really that well, they don't really know much about saxitoxins in the Great Lakes, or most specifically Great uh, Lake Erie. And so they have found genes for where the saxitoxins can be produced, but they don't know the exact source of how they're getting in the Great Lakes. And so what stimulates algal growth? Uh, there's three main components. There's the temperature, light, and the nutrients. So temperature, um, when increased, generally the algae biomass increases with, the with the rising temperatures. But we didn't really account for temperature in this experiment. Um, light is kind of like if there's not enough light, the algae can't really you go through photosynthesis, and if there's too much light, it's actual, actually harmful for the algae. It kind of disrupts them. So more, generally, more light, it makes more, uh, the algae are able to produce more. Um, and the light increases, or the light decreases as the depth increases in the lake. And nutrients, phosphorus is most commonly considered a limiting, limiting nutrient. Um, there's also finding that the importance of nitrogen, especially reduced forms of nitrogen, are being more recognized as also important factors in certain lakes and limitations of the algae growth. And these human causes are leading to increase, like things like agriculture and things like that, are you know, leading to increased nutrients in the lake. So. A question that my experiment, this experiment is trying to answer is which nutrients and light levels stimulate the benthic algae growth, and can these benthic cyanobacteria produce exotoxins in Lake Erie? Uh, this is a setup of, uh, of the experiment and how it works. The, we had these plastic cups, and in the plastic cups was an agar solution with the nutrients, and then on the top there is a porous chip. And the algae, the nutrients were supposed to, will flow out of the substrate, and the algae will colonize on the tips that we will later measure to the chlorophyll. And this is more of our setup. We have six different treatments. We have a control, a phosphorus, a nitrate, and ammonium, and a combination treatment of phosphorus and nitrate, and another combination treatment of phosphorus and ammonium. And there are 10 cups for each treatment. And we had a treatment at half a meter below the surface of the water on the, along, the, uh, along the dock. And then we had another uh, treatment that was two meters below the surface. 
in our data collection, we used the Floral Probe, and we had three data points. So we had one two days after the experiment was in the water, seven days after, and our final data point was at 14 days afterwards. And we measured the abundance of chlorophyll in the diatoms, the green algae, the cyanobacteria, and the total concentration. And these are some of our graphs. And on the y-axis here is the measure of chlorophyll. And on the x-axis is the date. And the different colored lines are the different nutrient treatments. And we have one graph for the high light level and one, one graph for the low light level. So this is the high light level. And you can tell that the abundance of algae increased over time for all of the treatments. And the high light level increased higher, more than the low light level. And this is the same, the same setup, but this time we're focusing on just the cyanobacteria abundance. And you can see also that it increased over time and that it was higher at the high light level. And you can also see the pink lines there is the phosphorus and ammonium <coughs> combination treatment was a little bit higher than the other. And here's a bar graph of the total algae at the, on the last day, the last day of data collection. And according to the two-way ANOVA test and the SUSI test, the treatments for the phosphorus and ammonium combination treatment were significantly different than the phosphorus, not only the control, but the phosphorus only treatment at both high and low light levels. So the gray is the high light and the black is the low light. And we found same or similar results of the cyanobacteria at, on the last day of data collection. The, again, the phosphorus and the ammonium treatment was significantly different than both the control and the phosphorus only treatment. And we also did an identification of what was growing in you know, on the substrate, like exactly what kinds of uh, what kinds of algae. So we had a cyanobacteria, we had a uh, chlorococcus, and a phantasomazon, and we had several different kinds of diatoms, and we also had pediastrum and the cenozoic as well. And these are some pictures of those. And now we're going to transition and compare some of the results that I had to. Uh, an experiment that uh, Chapin et al. performed, and they had a similar experiment where they had um, different nutrients, and after incubation, they found similar results that the ammonium and phosphate combination treatment, with, especially with the cyanobacteria, um, was significantly higher than just the phosphorus only. So, and same results are in uh, the experiment that I ran, so you can see that it's um, in congruence with that. And, and then we can also compare uh, the RE student, REU student last year, Jade, she did the same experiment and we came up with the same, very similar results where the, P, the phosphorus and ammonium were again much higher than the phosphorus only. So what do these results mean? Uh, it means that adding phosphorus and reduced forms of nitrogen will stimulate both the water column and the benthic cyanobacteria. And there's been a trend of increasing reduced nitrogen and a trend of increasing phosphorus. As you can see um, on these two graphs here over time. So Minimizing the phosphorus will slow the growth of both water column and the benthic cyanobacteria, as well as other types of algae. And it's finding that it's important to control both reduced forms of nitrogen and phosphorus to help further decrease the harmful algal, algal blooms in nature. For future research, we're going to deploy another trial of this experiment uh, actually on Monday. And they will repeat it again in September to see 
different in season, parts of the season. And we will also that some of the chips also got sent off to do DNA analysis um, to see if there are genes where saxophages may be produced, and also to measure if any um, concentration or abundance of, of the saxitoxin. And I'd like to thank Ohio State University, Ohio Sea Grant, Ohio Department of Education, the RU program and scholarships. It was an awesome experience to be able to be up here and um, do this kind of stuff. And um, well, very importantly, Dr. Chaffin, he was a great help for me. And to be able to be a research coordinator and put all this off for undergraduate students is a great opportunity. And also the other people at the lab, like Sierra and Allie and Tom, for helping me out. And the University of Toledo for allowing the use of, our, of the uh, chloroprobe one. Thank you. Generally, it's more in the water column, but I guess it's like a benthic form of the thermodynamic. Do you find any like types of, especially the sound right that are really on and very much associated with sediment or benthic material? We didn't, for the ID, we didn't really, we just kind of did a very general uh, surface level look just to kind of see what was grown in there, so we didn't really look too far into that. No, yeah, I was, yeah, I was curious. I was, I was, I guess, surprised by what I was thinking and not knowing much about the algae, but seeing what looked like a lot of the lab itself. Yeah, that that might be because um, it's very difficult to get actually right down into the benthos because of the wave action and all of the invertebrates down there and the messing up of the sediment. We are only two two meters below the dock, which is. Um, it can still be it's still considered in like benthic zone, but it's not all the way down there. So I guess it can be like a, more of a mix of water column and benthic. I mean, there's a lot of things uh, that are in the benthos that get swept up into the the uh, plankton, um, either accidentally. Job, who's a uh, going to be a senior at the Ohio State University, and she's uh, majoring in 
environmental science with a specialization in soil science. And you might wonder why is a soil scientist going to be studying aquatic things? But in my opinion, that's the perfect person to be studying aquatic things because I was a soil science major as an undergraduate and now I'm studying si uh, aquatic things. So um, Katie has, a, I think, a very interesting project. It was one of these projects we're going into it. I was really nervous. Um, it was a very risky project. It had a lot of opportunity for us to get no data for the summer. So I'm very glad we have some interesting data that Katie could present to us. Thanks, Dr. Reedy. All right, so just to reiterate, um, for my project, I am looking at the um, ability of microcystis to bring nutrients from the sediment layer of the lake to the surface water. So just a little bit about harmful algal blooms. Um, we know that they contaminate our freshwater ecosystems, um, Lake Erie being one of these. Um, this is an important water source for um, us to drink. So if the water treatment facilities are um, aware of these blooms, then they can add nutrients um, to account for these toxins in the water. Um, an example of this is the Toledo water crisis. And you can see how that affected um, the, the whole town, the whole city. Um, another uh, use of Lake Erie is human recreation. Um, people are swimming, they're kayaking, um, they're fishing. Um, we use this water to, uh, as irrigation for our crops. And um, overall, this depletes the oxygen in the lake, um, creating dead zones. And this is important um, for fish, for other organisms that um, live in the water. So microcystis is the dominant cyano cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, in Lake Erie. Um, they produce a toxin um, called microcystin, um, uh, which damages the liver. And this is important because humans and animals, um, it leads to death. And there's lots of humans and animals out in the lake, so don't let Newton out there in, the, in August. Um, so, uh, microcystis um, obtain nutrients in various different ways. Um, they are fueled by phosphorus and nitrogen, and that can be entered through the lake um, through agricultural runoff, um, through combined sewer, sewer overflows. Um, another way that they obtain nutrients is through internal nutrient recycling. And this is when nutrients are taken from the sediment, uh, the sediment layer of the lake, and they are brought to the um, water column. And this is important because it can allow for a larger bloom to take place than what was anticipated based on the nutrients um, that the, the concentration of nutrients that were in the watershed alone. And it is not well known how much phosphorus these microcystis, uh, microcystis uh, internally recycle. A um, little bit more about their life cycle. Um, these resting cells remain, do uh, remain dormant in the sediment um, over uh, the winter from previous year's blooms um, in the sediment. This is where they accumulate the excess phosphorus and they store it in their polyphosphate granules. With the right conditions, such as high temperatures and light, the cells emerge and that's where the bloom begins. And um, again, this is the internal recycling. They bring the nutrients from the sediment to the surface water. Um, uh, for an example of how much they are bringing up with them, um, one cell, one uh, algal cell, may contain enough phosphorus to produce 18 daughter cells, which is a lot. So my question is whether or not microcystis acts as a biological um, phosphorus pump uh, from the sediment to the surface water. And my hypothesis is that the ability of microcystis to store this excess, phosph excess phosphorus allows for um, an increase in concentration um, at the surface water as it emerges from the sediment. So we collected our samples from three different sites, one of those being as far as the Maumee Bay. Um, but for the data I'm going to be presenting to you, um, it's based on our site three, which is right in the middle. Um, we collected four cores at each of the sites, and we used a sediment tube core to collect those uh, samples. And basically, you just reel that down, release a weight, 
the suction um, keeps the, the sediment in the tube and you can reel it back up and then there's your core. So here is a picture of some of the cores that we collected. Um, from this, we took about the top five millimeter layer of the sediment from each of the cores and we did that because that is where microcystis um, believe uh, to be to reside in the soil before they bloom. So by doing that, we were able to collect the rusting cells. So for our setup, we had six flasks per site. We homogenized the soil and distributed them to their respective flasks, added filtered lake water, and we incubated them, um, tried to, uh, um, to duplicate what the lake conditions were like, temperature and light. Um, once we uh, observed some growth, then we processed the samples. So uh, here I did a little, made a little doodle to kind of describe what was going on. So uh, in the water column, we have the uh, particulate phosphorus um, that is floating around. And in the bottom, that's where the uh, microcystis lie. And they, in here, they collect uh, the uh, phosphorus and the bioavailable phosphorus in the sediment. And when conditions are right, they rise to the surface, and that's where they remain for until they until they uh, descend back to the bottom. And so, what we did was um, we oh no. All right, so um, once we um, observed the growth, we collected samples from the top layer and samples from the middle layer, and we did that in order to um, account for any other particulate matter that was in the water column. Um, so when we measured the phosphorus concentration, we could account for that, and we could also look at the different microcystis um, colonies growing in the top layer versus the bottom middle layer with the flow cam. So a little bit about the flow cam, um, you put your sample in through the top, um, a pump drags it through. Once uh, the particles trigger um, either the auto image or the laser, then the camera takes a picture through the objective and lens, and that's what these are. So basically it's just a fancy microscope. So here is from one of our um, flasks. Um, it was a sample from the top layer, and here, are what we believe to be old resting cells from previous year's blooms. Um, we think that they are old colonies that have viable cells that um, emerged to the surface layer. All right, so now for some results. All right, so this slide is based on data that Dr. Chaffin um, has collected out by the Gibraltar buoy out here, and it's for the year 2015. So this graph is a representation of the total phosphorus that, um, that is gained by the bloom, but that cannot be accounted for based on the dissolved reactive phosphorus that was lost. So right here you have the blue dots, which is the dissolved reactive phosphorus. Um, that is the bioavailable form that the algae um, take in to grow. And the uh, total phosphorus are the red dots. And the green line, the chlorophyll, is going to be a representation of the bloom. So at the start of the bloom, the dissolved reactive phosphorus is right about here. And the algae took all of it in to about zero. And uh, total phosphorus was right about here. And as the dissolved reactive phosphorus is taken in, then there is an increase in total phosphorus. But the um, increase is greater than what was available in the water column for the algae to take up. And in the next slide, it's going to, um, we did some calculations and it's going to be a graph representing the years 2015 to 2018 um, and it's going to be the um, excess phosphorus that cannot be accounted for. And as you can see here, um, this is a line of evidence that um, the, there's excess phosphorus coming from somewhere, and that somewhere is what we believe to be the microcystis. Um, 
internally recycling it. Um, so uh, relative to the bloom, this is a substantial number, as you can see. Um, this account, this amount accounts for roughly 12 to 33 percent of the um, bloom's phosphorus. Um, uh, the top values um, represent the amount of phosphorus that needs to be available in the sediment for the microcystis to um, bring it up to account for this phosphorus, the excess phosphorus. And it ranges from 600 micromoles of phosphorus per meter squared to 6,000, which is during one of the largest blooms in 2015. So the graph on the left is um, from our data, and it is the particle density from the top and middle layers of the flask. So um, uh, as you can see, the top layer had predominantly more um, particle density of microcystis than the middle layers, which is what we hypothesized. Um, as there were other particles present in the uh, flask, we did not show this um, data on this graph, so um, that can uh, confound our results. Um, the graph on the right is a particulate phosphorus um, concentrations in the top and middle layers of our flask. Um, these that are at, uh, have asterisks are erroneous um, as we believe it didn't filter correctly, and that's why the values are so low. But uh, two out of the three graphs, um, or yeah, two out of the three flasks um, had greater phos uh, phosphate concentrations on the top layer than in the middle um, of the water column. Um, and um, of this data that we obtained, they, uh, we treated them as statistical replicates. We took averages of the phosphate concentrations at the top layer and uh, averages at the middle layer of the phosphate concentration, and then we subtracted those um, to determine how much of this phosphorus we could attribute to the microcystis. All right, so this is um, an estimation of the um, internal recycling that the microcystis um, brought up, of the phosphorus the microcystis brought up with them as they emerged. So for our study, um, we uh, observed that it took 10.4 uh, micromoles uh, per meter squared um, that the microcystis brought up that much with them as they emerged. Um, to put this value in context, uh, the amount of phosphorus we um, need to come from the sediment at the jib buoy um, is anywhere from 600 to 6,000 micromoles um, of phosphorus per meter squared, and that was in the previous graph that I showed you. And with that, you can, um, uh, it accounts for the excess phosphorus. And in a compared study, um, one that Matasoff did, um, he uh, studied um, different methods of phosphorus recycling, and um, they found that in one day there was 43.5 micromoles um, per meter squared of phosph phosphorus that was recycled. And for our conclusion, um, for our particular study, um, the emergence of uh, microcystis uh, did not appear to have a large capacity to alter the phosphorus concentration, um, but it is similar in the magnitude uh, compared to the other um, me mechanisms of phosphorus recycling. Um, like in the Matasoff paper, it was uh, a fourth of what they found to be um, recycled up from the sediment. Um, for future studies, I think it would be beneficial to take a look. We did um, our experiment in the lab. I think it'd be uh, beneficial to look at this in the field and collect the algae in the water itself using um, cones that will trap the algae and will give like a defined surface area so we can determine how much um, phosphorus they really are bringing up relative to the lake size. Um, acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Dr. Bates uh, for being an advisor for my project, Dr. Chaffin and staff, Kira, uh, Hallie, and Tom, they analyzed my uh, phosphorus data.
and for Stone Laboratory for the scholarship. Um, without the without the funding, this project wouldn't have been able to take place. Um, Noah for the ship time for when I collected my uh, when I collected my sediment, and Dr. Chris Winslow and uh, Dr. Kristen Fussell, along with other um, Stone Lab friends and family. And now for questions. <laughs> Dr. Doug? So, um, <laughs> as you probably are aware, um, microsystems live in a 3D environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you showed where you collected it from. And thinking back to some of the other presentations, this term came up the outside seeker. Where else could it get lost surface from? Other Are you talking about like the river? I wasn't looking at you. I was looking at Doug. Are you talking about phosphor, or are you talking about um, the river? Thank you for everyone for joining on the phones. Goodbye.